cap off our introduction to forces and starting the dynamics unit, the last thing we have to talk about is probably one of the most important tools that you will learn in this course. It's very simplistic, but I guarantee you it will save you a lot of trouble. What we're going to look at is this thing called a free body diagram. Generally, we're going to refer to it as an FBD, a little bit easier to say. An FBD, it's a vector diagram, and it's going to be a vector diagram of an object in isolation. So what we mean by this is the object that we're looking at, we're going to assume it's literally the only thing in the universe, and we're going to examine the forces acting on it. Now, the object that we are examining, if it's a person, a car, a flying pig, doesn't really matter what it is, it's going to be represented by a single dot. So everything in the world can be condensed down to a single dot, and we're going to show all the vectors acting on that object only. Now, what we want to make sure is that all the tails of those vectors, they're going to meet at the dot. The critical thing, and it's super important with free body diagrams, you only draw force vectors on the diagram. So we don't draw acceleration, velocity, any of that stuff. It's strictly for forces. So when you're drawing an FBD, we're talking about reference coordinates needing to be shown. What we would say is kind of tell us what is your positive convention. Like are you calling east positive? Are you calling north positive? Are you calling south of west positive? Like, you know, you want to, you want to tell us what is positive. Now, the, there's two important points. Actually, there's three. When we're looking at free body diagrams, we only care about forces that are acting on that object. We don't care about forces that that object exerts on others. We only care about the forces explicitly acting on it. That is the power of the free body diagram. And then just some technical points. These will get expanded on a little bit more later. So we have an object, if it's either at rest or moving at constant velocity, so in this case, the acceleration is going to be zero. The forces need to be balanced. Or another way of saying that is the net force is going to be zero. But that's something we'll talk about a little bit later. If your object happens to be accelerating, your forces aren't going to be balanced, and your net force will be in the direction of the acceleration. That is also something we're going to talk about a little bit later. What we want to do now is we want to show you, I just want to show you a few different examples of how a free body diagram works. You will be exposed to this so much in Physics 20 and Physics 30. It may be a bit of a rough start learning them, but I assure you, you will get a lot better at them. I've seen that every year. Students always start with a little bit of difficulty. By the end of the course, they're pros at it. So we want to look at a free body diagram for a book sitting on a table. Now, there's two ways we could do this. So first of all, I'll just draw a table. Why not? So I'm not an artist. Don't judge my table too much. So here's my book. We'll call it the Pearson textbook for physics. Now, the first thing is the force acting on this, or the kind of one we always want to go to straight away, is the force of gravity. But if that was the only force acting on this object, we said if the forces aren't balanced, this object's going to accelerate in the direction of the net force. So without something else, this thing is going to collapse through the table. Books generally don't do that. What we need to do is we need to have a force that balances that out exactly. That is where we're going to have this normal force we talked about earlier. So that normal force comes between contact between two surfaces. So it's going to be perpendicular to the surface, and we're going to want it to balance out this FG. So we're going to have something that looks a little bit like this. Now that's just a nice little diagram. How we would actually draw this in terms of a free body diagram, instead of trying to draw out a book or what looks like a brick, we're just going to represent that with a dot. And then we're going to show our two forces on here. So we have the force of gravity acting down. And I have this normal force that's going up. We talked about reference coordinates. I'll just say up's positive. We're not doing anything with this, so it doesn't really matter. But this object, books sitting on a table, they're at rest, so the forces are balanced. So the object, we would say, is at rest. When you're drawing the free body diagrams, try to draw them as, to scale as best you can. 
We're not going to pull out a ruler and measure exactly, but you know, you do want these to look roughly the same. So we want to draw a free body diagram from a mass hanging from a spring scale. So again, we got to get a little creative with our drawing here. So here's our spring scale, and there's like a spring on the inside, and there's a hook, and I don't know, here's our little mass hanging from it. Again, I'm not an artist, don't judge me too harshly. So on this thing, we are certainly going to have a force of gravity that acts down on this mass. So again, we're drawing it from the perspective of a mass because it's told us that's what we're looking at. So this mass is certainly going to experience a force of gravity. Now it's probably not going to accelerate forever and I probably should have said it's hanging from a spring scale and I'm just going to put at rest here. We're going to say it's not moving once it's done hanging. Now if that was the only force acting on it, this thing would continue to accelerate downwards and downwards forever and ever. What's going to balance that out instead as I mentioned earlier, this spring, whenever we pull it out of equilibrium, we kind of get it out of its natural resting position. It's not going to like that. It will not like that at all. What it's going to try and do is it's going to try and it's going to try and restore itself back to equilibrium. So if this mass is pulling the spring down, the spring is going to pull back up on the mass to try and restore that equilibrium. So I'm going to even just write that there. Again, you don't have to know about the whole equilibrium and spring stuff in much detail at the moment. That'll come a little bit later. So this is just a little diagram. Again, if we kind of want to draw this properly, here's our mass, a nice little dot. And then we have the force of gravity acting on it. And then of course, we have our spring force acting on it. So I forgot to mention this in the last example. When you're drawing your arrows, also, don't forget to actually label them with the forces. If, we, if you don't label them, then we don't know what it's supposed to represent. This is something we obviously can't mandate as teachers, but I always recommend for a lot of these problems, especially when you have multiple forces, get different colored pens. It's a lot easier to visualize. But again, if you're not a big fan of that, don't worry too much about it. So we're being asked to draw a free body diagram for a car traveling at constant velocity. So that word constant velocity, the moment that we see that, we want to think balanced forces. Or if we want to think of it more technically or appropriate for dynamics, we're going to say that the net force on the object is zero. Now again, we can certainly draw like a car. So let me draw my lovely little car here. Not a great car, but it works. Don't buy this, whatever you do. Now the car, it will experience a force of gravity. And in your experience of driving cars, they don't just collapse into the road. Well, this is Edmonton. That's actually a possibility with the potholes, but I digress. And then we're going to have that normal force that's going to prevent the car from going into the ground. Now here's where we're going to introduce some forces that we've talked about a little bit earlier. So we talked about things like applied forces. We also talked about things like, oh, what was it, the frictional forces. So the engine in this car, engine in this car is going to drive this car forward. So we're going to say that that's some type of applied force. You said force of engine, honestly, no big deal. Now, because this thing is moving at constant velocity, however, the force of friction that is opposing this, or we need some force that's going to oppose this applied force. Most likely it's going to be some drag force or some force due to friction. I'll call it drag for now, but if you called it FF, not really a problem with that. Now this is a pretty bad looking sketch, so I'm going to clean that up. So we're going to clean that up here. So there's my little dot, there's my car. So we're going to have this force of gravity here. We're going to have that normal force that's going up. We'll have this applied force going to the right. Now, why I chose right, I probably should have been a bit more specific in the problem where the car was heading. I didn't say that, so I guess we're, it's up to us to guess that. Not that it really matters. And then, of course, we're going to have this drag force that's opposing the motion. I forgot to do the positive labeling on the previous diagram, so I apologize for that. For this, I'll just say 
we'll call right and op positive. Again, not really a big deal right now since we're not doing any calculations with it. But the main thing to note is that all the forces are balanced. Just because this thing is moving at constant velocity and it's balanced in both directions. In the vertical direction, we have FG balancing FN. This basically prevents the car from like spontaneously going up in the air or spontaneously collapsing to the ground. And then we have this applied force from the engine balancing out this drag force due to air resistance and other factors. And these are balanced to keep this car traveling at constant velocity. The inclined plane, this is the one that gets people and we're going to talk about these more in depth later. So I've included a diagram here already to label it. Now we're going to assume that the plane is not frictionless. Now I also didn't say whether it's moving down the plane or whether it's at rest. So I'm just going to say this is moving down the plane. Now on this mass, it will still experience a force of gravity. So there's going to be a force of gravity going down. And that hasn't changed. FG is still going down. Here's where people get trapped. There is a contact between this mass and the plane. There is a normal force. But remember, the normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. So in this case here, the normal force is actually going to be balanced. Or sorry, the normal force is actually going to be going up in this direction that's perpendicular to that plane. And that is also something that catches students all the time in this unit. So you got to be careful with that. And then, of course, we said the plane, it's not frictionless. So this box, it's going to want to move down the plane. Gravity is going to try and bring it, or gravity is going to bring it down. Now, the direction of motion is going to be down the plane. What that tells us is that the direction, or the direction of the force of friction is going to be up the plane. Now, I probably shouldn't draw the vector this long because I, I don't want the force of friction to overpower. So I'm going to just scribble that out. I don't have my white out with me. But yeah, we don't want to make that vector too long. So that's going to be my force of friction. And then let me just transcribe this into a proper FBD. So we're going to have our force of gravity that goes down. We're going to have that normal force that goes perpendicular to the plane. And then we'll have this little small force of friction here. If you want to label it as force of kinetic friction since it's moving, go ahead. For positive conventions, I'm going to just note it here right now. I'm going to have this coordinate system that's down with or parallel with the plane and perpendicular. Don't worry about that for now. That is something that's going to get explained in a lot more depth later, but that is an important point. All right, the last one here, we're going to draw a free body diagram for a skydiver who has fallen out of a plane. How unfortunate for them. Now, this one actually has two possibilities. So I'm not going to draw a skydiver and all that, just because, again, my artistic skills are not that great. There's actually two possibilities. Probably the most common one that we would have. So we have our skydiver. We're going to have a force of gravity, because, you know, gravity is going to bring the skydiver back to Earth. And then there's going to likely be some drag force or force due to air resistance. That works. Now you'll notice this drag force, it's less than the force of gravity. So the net force is still down, or we have a downwards acceleration. This is probably the most common one that I would see. But I'm going to note, this is before terminal velocity. The other possible free body diagram for a student who's maybe a little bit more advanced in their knowledge of physics, as you may or may not know, objects that are falling in the air, they're not going to continue to accelerate and accelerate forever. What's going to happen is eventually that force of gravity pulling the object down towards the earth, it's going to be balanced out by this drag force. The moment that they end up being balanced, this is where we would say the object reaches something called terminal velocity. So at terminal velocity, we're still going to have our force of gravity down. But this time, what makes it a little bit special is that drag force is going to exactly balance that force of gravity. So this object is no longer accelerating. It's still going to head towards the Earth, but it's no longer picking up speed. 
So we'd say that this is at terminal velocity. Because in the question I didn't specify, is it before terminal velocity, is it at terminal velocity, I'd have to accept both of these answers. They're both correct. Now technically also because we ignore air resistance in physics 20 and 30 for the most part, if you drew the free body diagram with just FG and not putting F drag at all, technically I gotta accept that too unless I mention the question like, hey, account for air resistance. So in terms of positive convention, I forgot to put that again. I'll just say down's positive. We'll explain that a little bit more later. The reason that we like drawing these free body diagrams, at the moment it might not seem clear why, and that's entirely fair. One of the big overarching aspects of this unit is we're going to ask you to determine this thing called the net force, which is that vector sum of all the forces that are simultaneously acting on the object, or what we call the resultant. The free body diagram is meant to give you a visual of everything that's going on, and it's going to help you set up a mathematical statement, which we call our net force statement, but we're going to look at that a little bit later. The free body diagrams, make sure you make good practice with them, but if you're having a bit of trouble with them now, I promise you, you will get a lot better at them. I've seen it every year with students. Some of them have struggles with that first, but they're experts at the end. So if you're having a little bit of difficulty, be patient. I assure you, you will be fine.